Six years ago, Australia sounded the alarm. A fish capable of exterminating animals on land had approached. Local scientists predicted it could upset the balance and change the ecosystem of the continent forever. Dozens of species wouldn't have a chance to survive. How could a small fish do anything like this? Well, let's look into it. You probably know that many years ago, fish got out of the water and onto the land. But at that time, it looked like this. Or something like that. Back then, the water was too crowded and there wasn't enough oxygen for everyone anymore. There were no predators on land, only insects crawling around. So fish grew paws and lungs and they became amphibians. And then, a few million years later, here we are. Hi. Okay. However, these fish have a slightly different purpose because they're not planning to evolve. Meet the Anabas testidineus, commonly known as climbing perch. They pose a real danger to all living things. If you think you need to be bigger to be a threat, think of the Argentine ants that are slowly taking over the world. Compared to them, the climbing perch fish are still pretty big, can grow up to 9.8 inches in length, and don't live in colonies, but that doesn't stop them from threatening any other species. See that sharp dorsal fin? It's only part of the climbing perch's armament. Their gill covers can change their position and are equipped with sharp needles. The fish use them to move around on land and to suffocate their enemies from the inside. Once a predator has swallowed a climbing perch, it will straighten its fins, expose its needles, and get stuck in the predator's throat. Sometimes this means instant death from lack of oxygen, while sometimes it causes a slower Ooh. death from hunger. Anyone who decides to take a bite can end up in that situation. Larger fish, birds, turtles, even mammals if they decide to swallow a climbing perch. This fish won't make exceptions for anyone. Even holding it in your hands is a challenge. Both the gill covers and the fins are very sharp, and it's like trying to grab a very hot potato, which also wriggles. Very hot potato. <laughs> but let's suppose that birds start eating the climbing perch and their population starts reducing. So what? I mean, what's the big deal? It's natural selection and all that, right? Unfortunately, this works only in regions where the perch fish is already a part of the ecosystem. If they arrive at a new place, they can ruin literally everything. For example, the lack of birds can eventually lead to an increase in rodents or crop-destroying insects, and this is a serious problem. Up to 40% of the world's crops are already lost to plant pests and diseases. Insects alone cause $70 billion in damage each year. They're doing quite well even without the help of the climbing perch. Reducing the number of birds is just crazy, but the climbing perch doesn't care about any of that. They just take over new territories, and if someone tries to eat them, well, that's their problem. The climbing perch aren't interested in this domino effect, where one endangered species is followed by another, then by a third one, and so on until everything around changes. Of course, we shouldn't judge them. After all, they're simply fish. Boom. Fish that cause big trouble. But where did they come from in the first place? As is often the case, scientists take a long time before studying the really important things. We don't know exactly where the climbing perch came from, but they probably appeared in Southeast Asia. Over the past four decades, they've made their way south through Indonesia, and they don't plan to stop. Apart from killing predators, the climbing perch can adapt easily. Like many other fish that have learned to go on land, they always have a plan B. If the waters where they live are too crowded, the climbing perch can get out and crawl into another body of water. If that one dries up, they'll just wait in the mud or find another place to live. Not enough food? They can get out on land. There should be something else there. Wow, these fish are cooler than Schwarzenegger. I hate Plan B. But how do you even move around on land if you're a fish? I mean, don't you think that's a bit of a contradiction? Climbing perch have figured it out and have grown a special organ for breathing on land. It holds some water and hydrates the gills, allowing the fish to live without water for days. But the climbing perch needs to keep its entire body moist to feel good, so the fish prefers to travel at night or in the early morning when they're still due. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But you can't just go from India to Australia on dew. After all, there are seas, different straits, long distances. So the climbing perch hitch a ride. They cling to the bottom of fishing boats and go wherever it takes them. 
It's very convenient when you can live in waters with different salinity, isn't it? Plus, a person can bring a climbing perch with them after accidentally catching them with the rest of the fish. I wouldn't be surprised if climbing perch have already learned to pretend to be dead so that when they get to a new territory, they can just get out of the boat and go about their business. This is how the climbing perch are expanding their influence, getting closer and closer to Australia, and since the local species evolved independently of the rest of the planet, one can only guess what kind of blow the newcomers can inflict. People are literally taught to recognize the climbing perch and immediately report them to the authorities, perhaps the police. It's a bird! It's a plane! No, it's Superman! Are you crazy? It's a climbing perch! We have to inform the authorities! Yeah, it's that serious. News about the climbing perch approaching Australia sounded like a declaration of war. Native species can be as deadly as they want, but they're just not used to such an adversary. Imagine a cactus that suddenly grew where no one had ever seen a cactus and no one was prepared for it. Animals are curious. They try to eat the spikes. They hurt themselves, and at best, they get injured. The same thing will happen with the fish. Even the spikes are pretty similar, and it'll take more than a century to get used to such a neighbor and learn to live next to it. <sighs> if you can get used to a climbing perch at all, where are all the Steves? Haven't you heard? They went to another lake. Finally. In a familiar environment, native species know their limits. Predators already know how and who to eat, prey learn to fight back, and add to this the climatic conditions. All of this creates a rather fragile but perfect balance. But as soon as some resilient species gets in the way, everything turns to chaos. Such species are known as invasive, and in most cases they are brought into a new territory by humans sometimes by accident, but the effect is still impressive. For example, at the end of World War II, the brown tree snake was accidentally brought to Guam. Perhaps the snake was in the cargo or even climbed in by the landing gear and ended up in paradise. There were almost no natural predators for the snake in Guam, but there were many prey animals that weren't used to being hunted. As a result, the tree snake began to breed at an alarming rate. The snakes exterminated most of the local vertebrate species. They caused thousands of power outages affecting private, commercial, and military activities. Those same snakes were also responsible for the death of poultry and pets, as well as the emotional trauma of residents. Imagine an animal that is not from around suddenly showing up at your house, like a lion or a hippo or even a snake, which moreover is venomous and dangerous for small children. Anybody would be stressed. In short, the snakes had a great time. Mission complete. And because Guam is a major transport hub in the Pacific, the snake's journey didn't end there. It's been seen on other islands and even in Texas, far enough from Australia, its native land. That's what invasive species do. Over the past 500 years, they've caused the death of 13% of all extinct species. Invasive species have been one of the causes of extinction for 25% of plants and 33% of animals. But snakes, fish, ants, and I don't know, cow parsnip aren't like the sudden meteorite that wiped out more than 75% of species when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. This means we have to stop those animals that are trying to take over new territories. Among other things, something will have to be done about the climbing perch. You shall not pass! Yes, yes. Thank you, Gandalf. Anyone else have any suggestions? Fish out every fish we can get our hands on? That would help, but only for a while before the climbing perch breed comfortably again. Then maybe poison? Whoa, whoa, that's too harsh. I mean, it would help get rid of the climbing perch, of course, but the local fish would be poisoned along with them. What's the point then? So it's pretty much the same. First, something happens because of human activity, and then this something needs to be fixed. And by the way, what about Australia? Enough time has passed since the first alarming reports. Have the fish made it down there? Well, it looks like somehow people managed to slow them down. Or they got there, and now there's no one to tell us about the disaster. See you later.